Uh, hello everyone, I'm Lara from Eproxima and I will host this meeting today. Uh, the last meeting, Raul Sánchez, software engineer at Eproxima, led a workshop on AML IP node programming using Python API for distributed in the inference scenarios. And today we have here Jan Faleboz and Sylvan Brockart, and they will talk about the potential of human processing in memory technology to speed up and reduce the cost and energy of machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence workloads. So, if you are ready, yeah, Jan, um, okay, it's your turn. You can share your screen. Okay. Uh, so, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jan Falbos. I'm in charge of uh, elaboration chip management and tech marketing at UPM. And uh, Sylvain Brocard, my colleague, is our most experienced uh, application engineer in the field of uh, AI and machine learning. We are going to present to you uh, the, uh, how uh, UPM PIM can accelerate and improve the energy efficiency of AI applications. UPMEM was founded in 2015 by Gilles Amour and Fabrice Deveau with the aim of providing a solution to the data and energy bottleneck of compute-centric architectures. Indeed, in the case of data-intensive applications, this architecture reached their limits with uh, communication between the main memory and the CPUs happening through a narrow bus with limited bandwidth, high latency, and most of the energy in the compute node related to DRAM data movements. The solution for this is to integrate powerful compute capacity into the DRAM memory die, that is uh, PIM DRAM. There are several ways to do so. At the beginning in the 90s, processing memory consisted in putting classical memory and logic in the same chip without modifying the memory structure. The technology evolved and the logic progressively integrated the memory structure either in its periphery or in the memory array. It was then necessary to introduce new terms to distinguish this technology. Thus, one refer to near memory computing and in memory computing. UPMEM technology falls in the first category and is the first PIM architecture to be commercialized in real hardware. For now, in memory computing only exists in the form of research projects. There is no product available on the market. We sold our first server in 20. 20, and since then, we have proven the capacity of the technology to speed up and uh, reduce the cost and energy of a large number of applications compared to CPU, GPU, and FPGA. But let me explain the technology in more details. A PIM server, an UPM PIM server, is a standard Xeon x86 application server where most of the DIMM slots have been populated with PIM DIMMs. Standard and PIM DIMMs coexist in the server, and the firmware is made aware of the specific configuration. A typical configuration totalizes 20 PIM modules. A module takes the form of a standard DDR4 2400 DIMM. It has a capacity of 8 GB and totalizes 16 PIM chips. Chips are produced using DRAM processes without manufacturing implication. And inside each chip, uh, eight processors coexist. We call those processors DPU standing for data processing units. You probably done the math. A typical configuration totalizes 2,560 DPUs for 160 gigabytes of PIN DRAM. A DPU is a simple modern general purpose processor. It shares the access to the, with the host to a DRAM bank called main RAM. Instruction and data caches have been replaced by instruction RAM and working RAM. DPUs are independent from each other's memory and they run asynchronously. Inside each DPU, 24 threads can execute independently. And uh, each inter DPU communication. Uh, take place through the host CPU. This architecture allows each CPU to work efficiently on its own fragment of the dataset, and even with its own programming routine, it shouldn't be different. 
the technology come with a set of tools that make the porting of applications as smooth as possible. Each, DP, each DPU can be programmed in a familiar language and with standard skills and tools. Appen provide a complete software stack that enables DPU to be programmed in C and APIs in common languages for host programming. Communication libraries make it easy to configure the DPU, organize the distribution of data, scheduling, and retrieve results. The compiler for the DPU target is based on LLVM and come with some tools of the LLVM toolchain. I'm now uh, passing the floor to Sylvain to present uh, two ML workloads, KMINS and Decision Tree. Thank you, Ian. Uh, so the idea with this project was to investigate the capability of MPIMS for, uh, for machine learning. I mean, roughly speaking, there are two kinds of classical machine learning algorithms, but supervised learning algorithms where there is a ground truth that you're trying to predict and learn and unsupervised learning when there is no such uh, target where you're just trying to find some sort of uh, structure in your data. So we took one of each, right? Uh, supervised uh, learning being decision trees and unsupervised learning for k-means. So about k-means, so for those who don't know, it's a fairly uh, simple algorithm. You pick a uh, number of starting centroids, you assign each point in the data set to the closest centroid, then you move each centroid to uh, the middle of its cluster, and you repeat uh, the operation until it converges. And eventually you're going to get there, and you, there you go, and now you have four clusters of data. Okay. <laughs> um, to the left is uh, the, the diagram of the classical uh, k-means algorithm, also called the EM algorithm. The E step, e -step being the one where you find the closest uh, centroids for each point, and then the M step where you sum uh, the cluster coordinates and you move the centroid to that uh, those coordinates, and then you, you just look. So for the DPU. Uh, there's no deep modification to the algorithm. It's just that uh, the E step and part of the M step is parallelized on the DPUs. So you take all your data, you, you slice it into uh, equal batches, you distribute them to the DPUs, and then um, you, you communicate to, you broadcast, you broadcast to the DPUs the starting centroid, and then each DPU does uh, uh, an assignment of, 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 its, of the point it can see to, its, to each centroid, and then it does a partial uh, average uh, of, of each cluster. And then all those partial averages are aggregated on the, on the host, on the CPU, which computes the new centroids, and then you repeat that. Uh, another thing is uh, you need to compute distances, right? There's, there's a lot of uh, Euclidean distances to, to, to calculate. And the, if you're doing that in a floating point format, the DPUs are not very good at it because they don't have floating point units. So <clears throat> before, uh, before we start the algorithm, the, all the data has to be quantized. And we did that on 16-bit quantization. Uh, so this is, this is just uh, to illustrate the pre-processing. Uh, all, all, uh, all data has been uh, uh, quantized as, as uh, 16 bit integers and then split between the DPUs. So, the first question to ask uh, when you do that, of course, is well, I mean, uh, do, we, do we modify the results? Is it the same algorithm? Uh, it's essentially something, there's no uh, analytical answer for it. You have to, you have to test it. Uh, and uh, so, by simply by taking a bunch of random data, random initialization, do, running the same algorithm on DPU and CPU. And uh, every time, well, you, you can associate a score, uh, which represents the quality of the clustering to both algorithms. And you can also compute the similarity between the CPU and DPU results. What we can see here is that, of course, because of the quantization, we've got uh, rounding errors. But, uh, the, the important part is that uh, the, the DPU algorithm doesn't fall into a different local minimum than the CPU one. So that's, uh, that's pretty good news. 
Now, in terms of performances, uh, the first uh, benchmark we did was on the often used uh, X boson data set. It's very convenient because it's a, it's, it's a tabular data set and it's it's not very big. It's a medium sized data set, just 1.2 gigabytes. And so here in orange, you've got uh, the, the training time for k means on CPU, in gray on GPU. And then uh, the blue line is uh, GPU training time as you increase the number of available GPUs up to the maximum of uh, 2,500 approximately on a, on, a, on a server. And at the, using a full server, we get a, a 2.37 acceleration compared to GPUs. Um, but then, of course, we could say, what about a bigger data set? Um, then we created a re release for terabyte data set, so we did a test on that. Uh, just uh, the full data set is 30 days, but we just took one fourth of a day because that's what fits uh, on a GPU, and we wanted to compare to GPU calculations. And um, uh, also, because we're taking this time, better data set, we also consider the better uh, CPU library because scikit-learn is not really a performance library, but uh, Intel has a, a version of scikit-learn that's made for performance. And this is the red line. So overall, yeah, we still have some uh, some improvement compared to CPUs, but not, not very large. Um, there's also something else to consider. You can do an experiment where you take a random data set, you keep the data set the same absolute size, but you change the number of dimensions and you, you change the number of points so that the, same, the size remains the same. And we see that the higher you go in dimensionality, the better the CPU performs compared to the DPU. And what we're seeing that is that it's simply because doing a k-means algorithm is essentially a matrix multiplication. And so the, the effect of this orange line going down is what we're seeing is simply uh, uh, the AVX instructions doing their thing. And you know, the CPU, x86 are uh, very good at uh, multiplying uh, wide matrices. So about decision trees, right? Maybe, maybe this one looks better. So everybody knows decision trees, right? You take a number of points and then you divide them uh, among criteria until uh, you, you you can't split your uh, nodes anymore. <clears throat> so on uh, on CPU, this is, this is the graph once again, where you, know, you look at an active leaf, you evaluate all the splits you can do, you pick the best one, you create two new leaves, uh, and then you, you keep doing that in a depth first fashion until the tree is finished. To do that on uh, on DPUs, of course, you want maximum parallelism. So instead of doing it in depth first, we do it in breadth first. And so that, that's the idea. Uh, those orange bodies meaning that this is, this is something we do for all leaves. So <clears throat> you, instead of looking at the leaves one by one, we look at all the active leaves. We decide on the host which split are we considering right now. Then we are sending that split uh, metadata to all the DPUs. They all evaluate that split. Uh, they do a partial evaluation, which is then aggregated on the host, and so on until you get uh, a best split for 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 for, for, for a leaf, and then you repeat until you can't you can't split your tree anymore. Um, in that case, well, we don't have to. We, we also did you know some sanity check. This is not that like in the Kamin because. When you're doing uh, decision trees training, it's okay to use, uh, we, we don't have to quantize, we can use floating points because even if you don't have a, a floating point unit on, on your processor, you can do very efficient uh, comparisons in, uh, in integer. Uh, so you know, those comparisons were just to check that uh, I mean, this was working. And also we can see that the numbers are not exactly the same, which is, reassuring for me because it means I did not accidentally copy and paste the same data in both batches. Um, in terms of benchmark, well, a bit in the key. So if you look at the X boson data set, uh, what we see is we don't get this very nice straight line like with the k-means. 
we we get into a saturation regime uh, before that. Uh, we've only a thousand DPUs, we're already at peak performance. And then all you know the static costs and everything uh, make it so there's no point in using more DPUs. Uh, and uh, in that case, we, we can see it very well, but the, the gray line at the bottom is uh, the GPU, so we, we don't reach GPU performance. So what if we look at uh, it's something a bit, uh, bit bigger, again, the Criteo data set with one fourth of a day. In that case, okay, now we are uh, passing, we are, we, are, we are exceeding the performance of the GPU, not by a lot. But uh, but we, we we get there eventually. Uh, we still still you know, we're still getting into saturation. Still not not in the linear regime. So we could consider okay maybe it's just the, the, the set is too small. Uh, and okay so we, we can go you know, to much bigger data set, taking two days of of crypto, the crypto terabyte. Um, and in, in this case, of course, we can't do a comparison against the GPU anymore because it doesn't fit in its memory. But we can still compare to, to, to the CPU. And you know, we have, now we have a, a nice scaling. So it's really a matter of, of, of handling the parallelization costs. Um, so yeah, what, what, what can we learn from that? Is first off, uh, the, the biggest question is, you know, looking at the task you're trying to achieve and asking, does it look like a matrix multiplication? Uh, and probably in that case, you know, is not going to be the best uh, candidate because because x86 CPUs are already pretty good at that. Um, um, however, you know, they, they, they are much better for for uh, patterns where you have a lot of pointer chasing, random access, uh, a lot of branching, uh, things where yeah. If or not so good. Um, other than that, yeah, you you generally want to use uh, either large data set to use all the memory, or if you're working on medium-sized data sets, uh, you can get better performance usually by just replicating, uh, doing some data replication so that all the DPU banks are completely used. Um, and, uh, yeah. Now, now that you have a clear view of uh, those two workloads, let's look at the energy efficiency impact of AlpMemPIM. In the case of decision tree with the two days retail data set, the best speed up we achieved uh, is uh, of uh, more than 40 times. The PIM implementation uh, is uh, 40 times faster. Uh, than the, TPU, uh, the CPU implementation, and it consumes uh, 16 times less uh, energy. In the case of k-means, uh, with the quarter days retail data set, the PIM implementation is 1.4 on 2.8 times uh, faster than the CPU and GPU implementation, respectively, and it consumes uh, 2.2 times less energy than the GPU implementation, but 1.8 times more energy than the CPU implementation. As you can see, uh, a PIM, uh, can uh, uh, um, lead to, to better performance and uh, an improved energy efficiency, but the benefits vary depending on the workload. On one hand, uh, saving can be significant, but on the other hand, for certain workloads, uh, for which the, the speed up uh, can't uh, compensate for the additional uh, en energy consumption in use by the PIM models, uh, it, results bad, uh, it results in an increased energy uh, consumption. Uh, in general, applications that are best suited to run on a PIM are those with highly parallel operations, those with irregular access uh, pattern, data access patterns, or those with algorithms that are difficult to vectorize. In addition to these two workloads supported by Sylvain, I would like to highlight the work of uh, two of our partners. The University of British, British Columbia uh, is working on accelerating the lookup tables steps uh, of DLRM, 
by performing inferences on the RM2 model provided by Diprexis and a random dataset. They compared the results with the Facebook Cafe 2 implementation uh, and UpMemPIM uh, accelerates uh, the inference pipeline by uh, 14 times for large uh, batches. And uh, we estimate that the total, total cost of ownership is reduced by more than 10 and the energy consumption by uh, three. The Rochester Institute of Technology published a paper that discusses the implementation of two convolutional neural networks, ULOV3 and EBNN, on the UpMampin system. And the PIM, for EBNN, the PIM implementation is more than 19 times faster and consumes 36 times less energy. As we come to the end of uh, this presentation, we have been able to delve into the uh, UpMem PIM technology and explore its impact on AI and machine learning workloads. Uh, the, there's insights uh, underscore the transformative uh, power of PIM, and we invite you to uh, reflect on uh, the possibility it holds for your own work and uh, industry. The time is the floor is now open for your question. Thanks for attending. Thanks to you, Jan and Sylvan. Okay, so I think that we have arrived to the end of the meeting. So thank you very much for coming and exposing your your project. And that's all. Hope to see you here in one month. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much and bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both.